Hey everyone and welcome back. So in this tutorial we're once again going to build upon the groundwork we laid previously. We have our plane tracking and now our object placement. We want to get the option to add a few extra objects or object types into the world and that's what we'll be doing today. So to get this started what I'm going to do is go straight to the AR session origin and find the spawn object on plane script that we've made previously. I'm just going to double click to open this or go to the folder structure to find that. And I just want to make a few changes here first of all so that everything we do a bit later will be a lot more plug and play. So the first thing is we're going to need a public function in this class that we can call from a button when we start adding our canvas on so that we can choose the prefabs that we want. So below the update function we'll create our new public function which will be of type void. I call this one set prefab type. This will take one argument, which will be of type game object called prefab type. And in the function body, we're just going to set the placeable prefab, which is our original variable that we've exposed above before. And we'll set that to be the passed in prefab type. With that done, we can save this for now. Uh, we will come back and add the other bits that we need a bit later. But what this means is that we can now create our canvas inside of our editor and we can start dragging things on. So if we right click in the hierarchy window, we want to go to UI and create a new canvas. This will of course create the event system and the canvas for us. We can leave all of these options as default. And what I'm going to do is just create some buttons which will go at the top of the canvas. So I'm going to create the first button. So again, I'll right click on the canvas, go UI and button. And with this one selected, I just want to rename this and I'll call this one button prefab, or we'll call that button prefab one. I'm going to change the text to say prefab one. And then back on the button, I'm going to change the size for this one to be about 300 by 90, which should be perfectly fine. Change the text size to be 50 so that this is a little bit more readable on a mobile device. And finally, with the button selected, I'm just going to set the pivot point of this to be zero and one. I'm gonna set the anchor to be top left for this one. And then we will zero out the positions so that we get that nested perfectly at the top of the screen. Finally, before making the second button, I'm just going to come down to the on click functionality here. We're gonna add a new click function and we want this to take in the object of AR session origin. And then under the no function, we want to drop this down, find the spawn object on plane and use the new function that we've just created, which is our set prefab type of game object. The reason we've exposed that here is of course, we can come over to our prefabs and we can drag in our interstellar prefab. And this will be the first one, which, which is what the application defaults to anyway. I'm just gonna come into the prefabs folder, control D to duplicate the interstellar. Uh, we'll bring this in. And I'm just gonna change the material here to be something very, very simple. You can create a brand new object or a brand new prefab of your choosing. Just so that I can visually differentiate this, I'm going to just make the material black um, and maybe change the uh, color texture to none so that this is going to be very obvious uh, that this is a different object and I'll do the same actually I'll take the texture off of the albedo so that when we have both of these next to each other now it's going to be very clear which one is which. If you haven't already make sure that you update the overrides on your prefab. Just going to remove that and maybe give these some names now which will make it easier to differentiate them. So I'll call this one prefab 2 and the original one we'll call prefab 1. So remember, inside of the button prefab one, we have prefab one selected as the chosen object. So I'm just going to focus back in on the canvas. I'm going to control D to duplicate that button. I'm gonna give this one the anchor on the right. Again, we'll set the position to zero. And we just want to change the X pivot point to one. Again, we'll zero this back out and that will put that on the side just there for us, which is where we need this. And I'm gonna rename this one to button prefab two. And of course, go down to the text and change this to be prefab two. And then finally, selecting the button, we're going to change the object here to the object. So I should have called prefab two, so I'm just going to rename that, grab the button, and then drag this on in the slot of prefab two. So now when we press this button, this will obviously call the function that we've just created in our script. And the reason we've done all of that ahead of time is because I was able to then just copy the buttons with all of the scripts and everything assigned. So I'm just going to hop back over to the script as we're going to need to add some things here. Uh, and what I wanted to do is just run through the code 
kind of bit by bit so that we can see what would currently happen, what would go wrong, because this isn't set up to work just yet, uh, and how we can fix those. So at the moment, this will work. We will be able to call, if you were to build this to your device now, of course, at any time I say this, you can always just do a quick build and see what happens if you're not sure. It's a really good way of learning and actually getting an understanding of what the code is doing. But at the moment, we are replacing the reference of the object type here. But of course, because we're only moving the object when it's already spawned, this does mean that this will only take effect on the first or the only object that we press. Because if we come in the first time, then we instantiate it. If we press a second time, then we're not instantiating, we're just moving. So even if we change the prefab afterwards, obviously this won't work. So that's gonna be the first thing that we address. Now I did say as well that we wanted to add the option to add in multiple different objects. So we can account for this at the same time. If we go to the top and create some new variables, we can add all of this in one go. So the first thing is we want to have a list of stored placed prefabs in case you wanted to remove some, if you wanted to select and delete some. We won't be doing any of this, but this is the sort of approach we take. So this is gonna be useful to keep a reference and keep track of the objects we're spawning. So we'll create a private list of type game object. We'll call this one placed prefab list. And of course we need to instantiate this to be a new list of type game object. Okay, the next thing is we want to have an exposed variable to allow the designer or user to choose the maximum number of objects that you're going to allow them to place. So this will be, uh, we'll make this a private integer. We'll call it max prefab spawn count. We'll set this to equal zero just as a default. And we'll add a serialized field above this so that we can expose this in the editor. Now, because we are obviously making sure that we're not going past a variable, we want to make sure that we're keeping track of how many we have spawned. So we're gonna create another private integer and this will just be called placed prefab count. And this will just be tallied up as we go through adding objects so that we know how many we have in the world. Okay, and that is it. So the only other things I've noticed, we have this private variable that because I started it as a public uh, to demonstrate that previously, started the name with an uppercase P. I'm just gonna change that to be a lowercase so that we have all of the naming conventions in a similar way. And of course, uh, I want to change the references as well. So I'm gonna go Control F and replace all instances with this, but with a lowercase P. And I'll just do that on uh, whilst recording so you can see that change being made as well if you wanted to take the same steps. So we now have our variables. So the next thing is we're going to want to go back down to our update function. And I really should have had that code zoomed in. I'll try and remember to zoom in a little bit more when I'm typing the code so it's a little bit easier for you to see. So the first thing we want to address is all of this will be fine inside of our if statement here where we are instantiating an object. So this is gonna be a perfect check to keep in. We still want to know if this is the first object. If it is, then we want to instantiate this. We want to add an object to our list. So again, if we ever needed to remove them, uh, swap them around or anything like that, we have a list available. So we're gonna say placed prefab list dot add spawned object. And of course, we're gonna to want to increment our placed prefab count. So we can keep track of how many objects we have spawned in the world so far. Likewise, we can kind of keep this else statement, but we can start off by just deleting all of the code in here, as we're always going to be spawning something now, not moving things around. And we want to throw in a new if statement, and we're gonna check here whether the placed prefab count is less than the max prefab spawn count. If it is, then we know that we are allowed to spawn another object. So I'm actually just going to copy and paste this code just here. We just want to instantiate another object. And of course, we want to do this again as well. And at this point, this is where this is going to be a duplicated code. So to keep things nice and tidy, we'll come down here, we'll create a new function. We'll make this a private void function. We'll call it spawn prefab. We want to make a single variable that we pass in, which will be of type pose. And we'll call this one hit pose. And then inside of the function body, we can just grab one of these, paste that in here, and just tidy up the line spacing if needed. We can then grab our function name, we can just paste that in, and be sure to pass in our hit pose, as everything else will be available, the placeable prefab and the spawned object will be fine within those references. And then we can copy this, and we can paste that up here as well. So that is now looking a little bit tidier, and again, that will kind of work, but there's gonna be a problem here as well. So do think about what that problem might be, but we're gonna go straight into fixing that anyway. So if you had a little think, the problem is that we're running this on update and we are checking whether the try get touch position is just true or false. And remember the try get touch position is simply checking whether something is being pressed and until you release your finger again, that will keep being true. So that means that every update tick that will return true. And for as long as you hold your finger on the screen, we're gonna try to spawn as long as we have less 
placed objects than the max prefab spawn count. So of course that means you're going to have to have a really quick tap to make that only spawn one object each time you want to get a single object placed. So again, there's a very simple fix for this. What we want to use instead now of our if touch count is more than zero, we want to check. So we want this same if statement here, but we're just going to change it to be if input dot get touch is zero at dot phase equals touch phase dot began. So this will only return true the very first time this is returned that the touch has uh, entered the begin state essentially. So as soon as that's ticked once, it's going to be false afterwards, which means we'll return out of the update function down here as we want after only spawning the single object. Everything else in here is perfectly fine. We still want the touch position and everything, so we can leave that as it is. But that does now mean that this will only happen once. And of course, you've probably saw as well that this check is actually kind of pointless. So since we've been focusing on tidying things up, we now don't need to know if the spawned object is equal to null. We can simply take this, we can delete all of the other statements uh, because it was essentially doing the same thing. And then we can just move this back and we will only spawn things if we have less than the number of max spawned prefabs already spawned. That's all of the errors and issues that may occur from making uh, quite big code changes here that I could envision. So I think that should account for everything here, which means we can come back in and we can do a build and run to the device. And as always, I'll show you the results of that just to show that everything's working as expected. The only thing I did forget, of course, and that we do need to do is go to our AR session origin make sure that we have the max prefab spawn count something higher than zero because of course if you leave that then we're never going to be able to spawn anything i'm going to set this to something like five that should be perfectly fine a final edit to make is that i completely didn't notice i was changing the material on the actual prefab so both of my prefabs now look the same just for completeness i'm just going to make a copy of the existing material uh, which is now the one which it has no texture I'm going to change one to use the albedo texture that we had previously and the same for the color. Turn this one back down to a white color so that we get the full color spectrum coming through and just make sure that one of the prefabs is using this material and I'll save a reference to that and then the other prefab we'll just make sure is using its white material. So again this is going to be a bit more visible, a bit more obvious which one we spawned in when we are doing our test on the mobile device. Didn't realize I was doing it in the wrong place earlier so I just wanted again to cover that and not do it off screen and make the video confusing. Okay so if that all built to the device though you can see here that we're getting the standard plane tracking when I press, we're going to spawn in one of the prefab spaceships in the position. I can press the prefab 2 button. You can kind of see that happening on the screen. And then when I press on the plane again, we're going to spawn in the other type of prefab. And of course, I can toggle between these and spawn into the world up to five different prefabs based on the code that we've got. So they are the main changes that I said I wanted to get in. Uh, this is just a quick demonstration as I said of that happening. So if that done though, the only things left to do are to hit the like button. If you enjoyed or found the video useful, make sure you consider subscribing to be kept up to date with any of the content coming from any of the playlists on the channel. And do leave some comments below to let me know what you'd like to see next. This isn't just me trying to get the big engagement numbers thing on YouTube. This is pretty much the last thing I was considering doing on plane tracking. Getting an idea of what people are interested in seeing in the AR playlist is going to be really useful. So the next thing I was considering doing is moving on to image tracking and doing our own custom implementation of that. But again, if there's something you wanted to see maybe a bit more in depth on plane tracking or the other topics inside of the AR foundation that may be of interest, then do let me know. I can't guarantee I will do all of them, but I will try and do the ones that make most sense for this playlist without things getting too in-depth or too long-winded. So do leave those comments below to let me know what you wanted to see and if that this kind of covers everything you'd expected in the plane tracking at the very least before we do move on to completely new topics. So I'll leave that video here for today though. As always, thanks for watching and I will see you all next time.